Hey everybody, um, this is Doug Sanquist, and welcome to this episode of the Doug Sanquist Podcast. Where interested is interesting, and interesting people share their stories and build their biographies along the way. Today's guest is Mr. John Dunkel. Hey, John, thanks for joining me today. Hey, Doug, what a pleasure. Thank you. And John, as with all of our guests, I don't have a bio, and I haven't read a bio, and I don't know your bio, and that's the goal of this podcast, to figure out your bio. You okay with that? I'm good with that, and the reason that uh, you don't have a copy of my bio is because I don't have one, so I guess we're both going to be like in the dark with the headlamp on, trying to yeah. figure this out. So I guess so, yeah. So to start off, I'm going to, um, I have 10 quick, uh, quick, easy starter questions to kind of get you going. So um, there's no maybes here. So it's either yes or no, or pick, it's, pick it's, either one. Yes or, it's either yes or no, or pick one. Yeah. Okay. So question number one is gummy bears or M&Ms? M&Ms. All right. No question. S no question. Sweet or salty? Salty. Hot or cold? Cold. Would you wear flip-flops to Disney World? No. That's good. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Early usually rise. I pay, usually yeah. I pay like 50 bucks an hour for this, okay? All right. All right. Early riser or night owl? Uh, early riser. All right. Cow or chicken? Cow. Short hair or long hair? Short. Tattoos, yay or nay? No. Coffee or tea? coffee cake or pie pie bonus question sauerkraut love it or hate it love it all right cool all right all right so that now, wasn't out, bad. Of that, out of that <laughs> you can tell i'm an older white male right <laughs> <laughs> yes for sure i love that <laughs> yeah Okay. All right, cool. All right, what now, was what your do uh, you do for the rest of the podcast? Well, I got a few more. I got a few more. I got yeah. I got a few more. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, I'm not going to ask you how old you are because that's that doesn't really that really doesn't matter. So uh, what's your earliest? Know, old enough to know that you shouldn't ask me that question. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yep. yeah. So what is your earliest childhood memory? Uh, sitting on a thumbtack in my pajamas when I was about two years old playing hide and seek. All right. Was it one of those flat thumbtacks or like those? Like, yeah. Yeah, the thumbtacks that have got the little head on it, right? Yeah, so it stands good. up with the with the right. pointy end coming up, right? The flat with the flat on the end, right? That you push yeah, into the yeah, wall. Yeah. yeah, and I I remember you know climbing in this it was probably a two by two box, but to me it looked like Mount Vesuvius. So right. I had to climb in there in pajamas on, right? And all of a sudden sat down, boom, and there 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 it was. I let out a whelp. I I got to be honest with you. Right. It was kind of a wussy back then, I guess. <laughs> Where'd you grow up? What's that? Where'd you grow up? We uh, actually grew up in uh, West Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, we went to a uh, uh, small small school there. Used to walk to school seriously. I know it's a you know it's what all the kids say now. I had to walk up 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 hills you know both ways, um, but no, I used to uh, walk to school every day. And uh, was it a one room school? No, we had four <laughs> rooms. I think I think we had four rooms. As a matter of fact. It was it was preschool through I think second grade at that point in time. All right. Something like that. So yeah. And so where'd you go after there? Uh let's see, after there, my folks uh well, they brought me along, obviously, but uh we moved. I guess the we. I had I had no choice, but we moved to uh Chestnut Hill, which is a suburb of Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh at first grade I got to repeat I had to repeat two grades. I had to repeat both kindergarten. It was an age thing back then, apparently. So I was in kindergarten for two years. And then I went to uh, first grade, and I repeated part of the first grade. So I went to the Dexter School in Brookline, which was a uh, uh, private uh, school. Uh, went there from first grade until, uh, I think, when they uh, got a novels. I think it was, I started novels in seventh grade. So first through grade through sixth grade, Doug. All right, cool. So yeah. what, were your, what were your summers like as a kid? Uh, our summers were very different. My, 
my mom came from a, a family with three other sisters and my grandparents, who I dearly love, uh, my grandparents had a place in New Hampshire, which is where I am now, and in fact, not too far from where I am. And summers and vacations, we used to come up to New Hampshire. My great grandparents actually bought the place, and that, that's what it was called. It was 92 acres on a mill pond in New Hampshire. And uh, so I used to uh, grow up doing, uh, you know, haying and uh, working in the fields, driving on the, you could drive a truck a uh, hay truck back in the day that I think I was 12 years old. I was able to drive on the street, um, you know, as long as I was driving a farm vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. So summers, so it, it, summers for, for us were, were wonderful. I mean, you know, they're on the place that all the daughters would be with their husbands and, you know, my cousins. So there'd be 20, 30 people. I mean, it was amazing. So yeah. It, yeah. Was that where you learned to, um, did you fall in love with cars back then? I fell in love with cars. In fact, I uh, rebuilt my first Volkswagen engine when I was 14 years old. I bought a 57 Volkswagen for $50. Uh, my grandfather and I went down and bought it in Exeter, which was a couple of towns over. And, and I think we towed it back with a, with a chain, to be honest with you, behind the station wagon. That's back then when, you know, mm -hmm. you, the you could station do that wagon so, yeah. was the family vehicle. Right? Yeah. And uh, parked it in the field and, you know, 27 bolts later, the body was flipped off the chassis and it pulled the engine and uh, it actually ran when I put it back together, which was surprising. So yeah, I loved cars back then. And, uh, you know, put a, put a chair on it and uh, seriously bolted a chair to the floor pan and started up the engine driving around the place. So yeah, it was kind of crazy. No helmets back then either. No, probably no seatbelt <laughs> either, right? Uh, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you drive it off the property? Did you, did your dad? Uh, well, legally, no, you, I'd never do something like that, but it went pretty well on the roads. Did yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, it did. it did. I mean, you, you'd see like this, this, you know, chair, which was bolted to the floor pan with, you know, this kid and that would be me, you know, driving this thing down the, down the street, the brakes worked. That was good. And, uh, you know, the accelerator worked and anything else was optional. So yeah. yeah. Did you drive tractors and stuff around the, around the land? Oh, property yeah. Too? Uh, All the oh yeah, absolutely. I was, I was, uh, I, my grandfather had a gravely. Now I don't know if you know what a gravely is. It's this thing you, it, it's a small tractor. It's a, I mean, walk behind thing with a huge sickle bar on it. And I used to mow the field with that. And, you know, the thing is, is that back then there was really no safety. I mean, if you lost control of the thing, it'd whack off your, your foot at the ankle and it'd be a clean cut kind of thing. Um, but yeah, for farm, for farming equipment. Yeah. Um, you know, had, uh, there were tractors, a couple of, uh, two ends, I think they were, uh, used to hay the fields with and the neighbors back then that we used to, you know, help out the neighbors. That was kind of the thing you did back then. And they had horses and whatnot and getting in the hay and all the rest. And yeah, muck out the stalls, mucking out the stalls. So was working on the farm your first job? Yeah, um, it was. Cutting lawns, doing that. Um, then I went big time uh, a little bit later in life and started scooping ice cream um, mm. at the, uh, down by the beach right? It uh, used to be called, what was it? Was it bunnies or something like that? Uh, so I grew huge muscles, forearm muscles, scooping hard ice cream for, you know, thousands of beachgoers every season. And uh, probably met yeah. some pretty cool people then though, right? Oh yeah. It was, it was interesting. I mean, back then, uh, back then our, our highlights used to be, you know, going down to Hampton beach, which was the uh, the hippie place to go and looking at all the quote hippies with the long hair and tattoos and stuff, and, you know, um, we'd be down, used to go to the drag strip and whatnot and illegally, of course, but that's all right. right. But yeah, it was, it was all good. It was all good back then. So was, uh, growing up was going to college a given? Was that pretty much, was that part, was that a family, was that a family, uh, thing that John I, go to college? Yeah, my is that's a great question. The answer is yeah. Family expectation and pressure would be that you would go to college. Uh, my older brother, on the other hand, uh, dropped out of college, went into the into military service, and uh, so I think I was the first grandson to actually complete college education. 
but the family expectation would be absolutely you, you go to college. It's the only way back then, quote, you could get ahead. Um, and I look at it now and and go, I'm I'm not quite sure that's the case anymore. I, I think, you know, the, the practical experience uh, is more valuable and what they give back to society is more valuable. Um, in fact, my, my oldest son didn't go to college and I supported him absolutely with that. He decided that he wanted to get into the automotive business and, and uh, he's done extremely well. So, so much for a college education being a requirement nowadays. I don't yeah. think it's... I don't so, think what, it is. What did you, what did you take in college? I, uh, I went to uh, Boston University. Um, I almost went to the Naval Academy, but... I decided at last minute not to go to the Naval Academy and I never, never always wondered if that was the right choice, but I ended up at BU. I went to uh, two colleges within the university system, um, graduated with a liberal arts degree as well as a management degree and a five year program to get both degrees completed. Um, partway through a master's I never finished because I didn't really see the importance of it. And, uh, so never finished my master's. And even though I think I'm, I think I've got two, two and a half semesters, I don't know, into it. Of course, none of those credits count nowadays, but. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you never finished your MBA? Nope. Nope. And in fact, my first job out of school, Doug, was with a private entrepreneur doing, uh, it was just him. He was a home business. Um, and uh, I, he, it, was a technology consultant. Now here I was, I didn't have any experience whatsoever. So I was kind of, you know, the bean counter for the data analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and this is yeah, like late seventies, early eighties. This was early eighties. As a matter yeah. of fact, 1981, I believe. And, uh, we grew his business really well. We, the, the business CA Pesco associates was the with first name, Charlie, super nice guy. Brilliant. Um, used to work at a number of different places, very senior level strategic, uh, strategic planner. And uh, so I learned a great deal from him. And uh, he actually sold his business to 9X, which was a huge uh, uh, telecom country, uh, company back then. And uh, so that was part of my, my first job, quote unquote, we ended up selling the business, right? And, uh, it later became a company that had, and I'd, I'd moved on since then to get real experience. Um, that company, uh, CA Pesco, went on to, you know, be a major employer, 90 plus employees, I think. Um, really a great product. So, yeah, that was my first, quote, job out of, out of college. Wow. So when did you, uh, um, when did you start adding... Um like hobbies to your, did you start doing hobbies in, in college or, or carry them through like get the, you know, cars and stuff like that and other yeah, things. I, to, how did you incorporate that into your career uh, early on? I think, I think, well, first of all, you know, I, I've got a couple of hobbies, obviously cars, photography, and, and I've always done those. Um, but you know, life gets in the way of fun. And so those kind of things I put aside photography. I've always, been shooting whether it be film or you know nowadays digital and film but i've i've always been processing and, and shooting uh film and or photographs or whatever uh even my first time with a camera was back um oh, this is a great story the first time with the camera i was given a uh, little uh uh wasn't a brownie it was like a little ag for the pocket 35 millimeter you know from the 30s kind of camera and i had this crush on this girl and uh, i've got more pictures i took of that girl with this little camera so i was into photography when i was like 12 years old right um and then it kind of blossomed and i got the 35 millimeter minolta srt 101 um and i always took pictures and i always developed film and, and printed in even through high school so that hobby you know, it, it gets interrupted with real life, even though I always, I've always had a dark room, still do. Um, and, it, but real life gets in the way. So the hobbies have always been in there, Doug. All right. 
So what was your uh, job after uh, you left that, that f- your first company? Oh, uh, real quick. I worked for a, uh, I got hired uh, by a major cor- a corporation up here in New Hampshire, National Corporation. And I was actually an account manager for their major account program based in New York City. So I lived two years, I think it was, in, in Manhattan. And my clients were kind of Fortune 500. We'd sell paper and uh, uh, zero graphic supplies, toner and developer. Because remember, that was not a paperless society back then. Uh, everybody was making copies. And so everybody had copiers and Xerox, you know, we used to sell consumables for Xerox machines, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we'd be working with their, with their purchasing departments and be multi-million dollar contracts feeding, you know, 500 satellite locations of zero graphic toner and uh, developer and paper. Um, so I did that and then I got uh, promoted pretty quickly up into corporate, which was in Nashville, New Hampshire. And, and so that afforded me the opportunity to move back to New Hampshire. Um, then in the mid eighties, there was a bloodbath there, so to speak, mid to late eighties. Uh, and I got let go. Um, as well as most of the other people in my division. And of course, they did it so nicely. They actually had me, you know, lay everybody off that worked under me, which is about 50 people. I was fine. And then I was like 27 at the time. I didn't know. And I'm letting people go that are, you know, 50 years old, 55 years old. And then finally, at the end of the day, after doing this, and, you know, I was a basket case anyway, I get brought into the vice president's office and he goes, well, Jeff, you've done a great job. We want to thank you and, you know, pick up your paycheck on the way out. I'm like, what? So kind of gave you a little bit of a insight to how major corporations work back then. And, you know, it is what it is. Um, so from there, I uh, got into, because of, because of, uh, uh, the technology that goes at that point in time behind non-impact printers, I got hired by Genicom, I mean, uh, Centronics, which was acquired by Genicom in Hudson, New Hampshire, and started out as a uh, product manager in all their laser printer and, and non-impact printing division. And then yeah, there was a there was a time in the early '80s when you had the little ball and the little printer, where the, you know the dot, dot matrix printer was the was the thing, and that was that was the king. And then you know yep, lasers were IBM, like that was an IBM printer, and Centronics did the uh, line printers, which were high speed data data center printers. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Centronics parallel interface for those of you who've been around technology, that was. Uh, one of the uh, a standard like USB three and, mm-hmm. and USB C uh, is standard today. U, uh, Centronics, you know, parallel port was a printer standard back then, which was the most popular printing interface at that point in time. So my job there was to it's when laser printing commercial or consumer laser printing really was starting to come about, and uh, so I at a very young age used to go over to Japan meet with the you know folks at casio and sharp and all the rest and they'd look at this little guy me you know this youngster coming in to negotiate printing contracts for non-impact printers and so yeah that was eye-opening but uh so i got into printing and i've always i've always printed i guess and uh so yeah that's that's a short story on the on the printing escapades how long did you work there we got, uh, Centronics was bought out by Genicom. I ended up as a, uh, again, very, very young, um, very young. I think I was uh, 29 or 30, maybe 31. I wasn't as old as 31 yet. I ended up as a uh, senior director, vice president uh, for a multi-million dollar uh, printing company. I had, I had $300 million budget and I had I don't even know. I think I had two or 300 engineers and and marketing people throughout the world reporting to me again, very, very young. Um, But yeah, I went up the quote corporate ladder uh, pretty, pretty quickly, I guess. Do you have any idea that you'd work for a printing company in college? No, none. I always, I always loved printing and I love technology. I mean, when, when the IBM PC, first came out, I, I was one of the first to buy one. Or I used to have a Tandy TRS-80 Model 1. Don't know how many people know what that is. But we used to, uh, I used to go online using the telephone handset with an, 
uh, acoustic modem and get on the fight on it and all the rest back and that was back in uh, back in high school as a matter of fact and then they used to uh, program deck vaxes in and IBM 370s when I was in college I did uh, PL1 PLC uh, CPM uh, used to program uh, Z logic, but yeah, that goes way back. That goes way back for Z language. So, wow. yeah. So I've always, been, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I've always, I've, technology has always been uh, interesting to me. Um, and so I've always kind of dabbled in it. And later on in life after, you know, being a, after Genicom, uh, I left Genicom because we were based in uh, Waynesboro, Virginia. Actually, started a couple of my own companies and all technology based. But yeah, yeah. Cool. So, uh, how many companies did you start on your own? Uh, well, uh, three. I told. I think three. I don't know. Um, yeah. I well, the first one when I decided it because at that point in time I'd just been married and, and uh, my wife was expecting our first child, and so I was commuting between New Hampshire and Virginia, which Waynesboro, Virginia, which wasn't a Not lot the easiest of fun, commute. You know? Yeah. No, I mean you know I'd I'd pack up the bags Sunday night and be back you know Friday night Saturday morning, and that would be about it. And you know I did travel the world. That was when I was able to actually make it back but i think i've seen m with Jenica most of the countries in in throughout the world i mean their name a country probably you know if, if there's a business reason to be there i mean it sounds glamorous until what you understand is you land at the airport you get picked up by a limo you go to a hotel you have meetings you get driven back to the and you know that's kind of life on on the road and that was all before the age of 30, for the most part. Yeah, for the most part, it really was, Doug. Wow. Uh, you know, it, That's it, not a typical 30-year-old experience. No, and I, I think I'll always take luck over, over planning, and I think I was very fortunate. Uh, my career went very quickly, um, and I would look at my counterparts. For example, I'll go back to Japan. I remember Casio... Um, I had several dinners with the, because they had a non-impact printer. It was an LCD uh, transfer printer. Uh, and uh, the president of Casio was absolutely the most gracious individual you'd ever want to meet. And, and he, he used to take me out for dinners, you know, which was a ritual in Japan, as you know. And uh, he, I remember him looking at me and he goes, Mr. Dunkel, I have to ask. I go, yes, sir. He goes, how old are you? I go, I'm, 29 years old and he went you're here negotiating a 300 million dollar contract or whatever it was and he goes is everybody in your company in your company this young i go no Our chairman of the board is you know 65 years old he goes oh thank goodness but yeah i was very very fortunate i was very fortunate back then so yeah is that luck you think or is it the fact that you put yourself out there the answer to that question, I think, is yes. I mean, I was, and still am, uh, you know, somewhat outgoing. I've got an opinion, not not afraid to let you know what it is. Um, and I think it, anybody that puts themselves out there, I think, is accorded some degree of respect by virtue of them putting themselves out there. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them or, or we can certainly disagree with them. But I think a, a lot of folks who I see in middle management today aren't willing to be counted as their own. They kind of get this, and you and I, you know, have spoken about this before. They get this playbook, and the playbook says you can only do this and can't do that. And to me, I look at the playbook and go, yeah, that's a playbook. Close the playbook and, you know, do what I thought was best for the company. And that's a high-risk road to take in today's environment. I mean, we all talk about, oh, that's the thing to do. But when it comes down and you're supporting a family and, and you know, and uh, it, it's, it's, they're great words to say, but unless you do it, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. And that's a great question, Doug. That's a great question. Um, so 
um, I don't know a lot about it, but I've heard you talk about um, Haiti. So how'd you get started with, in Haiti? Uh, okay, let me backtrack because you asked me about the jobs because it will lead into Haiti. So <laughs> right out of, yeah, right out of, I'm trying to make a 30 second, con, you know, condense my, my life in 30 seconds. But uh, we have an so hour we, so far, so we're good. We're good. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, just give me like three minutes warning before it ends. But uh, yeah. I, <laughs> all right. So great stories. So I started a, uh, I started a newsletter, technology newsletter, right, right out of, right out of when I, when I came back from Virginia. And I actually started in the second floor of my house in the, in an unfinished bathroom, right, with a small little computer and started writing. So this is after you left the big company and you're yeah, on your own. Exactly right. I'm like, you know something, I've got the corporate experience now. I just want to kick back and see if I can actually do this. So the answer is, yeah, I, I started the newsletter and then all of a sudden it became extremely popular. We used to I used to have clients like, you know, Michael Dell and, and uh, you know, the, all the folks, you know, from Microsoft and, you know, Apple computer and all those folks. And, you know, they kind of got into this and into this newsletter It's about, a, you know, kind of here's where we are. Here's where we're going to go. It was kind of, you know, long term newsletter it was very executive level kind of research and opinion. And that kind of took off. And then, you know, I finally got forced out of uh, uh, that unrestored bathroom and uh, bought an, or rented a small little office space and uh, make a long story short uh, about two years later I had 35 employees and uh, and tra still traveling the world kind of thing um, but this time at least it was mine sort of thing and then uh, through a manner of, of different things that was that was sold off and I started another market research firm which got back to my roots, high level uh, strategic planning for senior executives in the technology world. Um, and uh, that took off as well. Um, I was very lucky, fortunate, whatever you want to say there. Um, and at the same time, go back to 1988, and I can remember the date, I was, I was into Porsches, you know, let's get back to hobbies for a bit. And it was a online uh, email service that uh, a lot of Porsche owners back then would subscribe to and you know without fail every couple of days it would blow up and we'd all have to resubscribe and you know it, it was if you're talking about your Porsche you don't want to hear that the server's down right I mean come on so this right. is like priorities yeah, right and priorities I mean we had senior executives typing emails right going hey my Porsche done that anyway well so, and 1988 was I mean, getting an email was like a, getting a email was like a big deal in 1988. Huge, I mean, right? I mean, if you got one. Yeah, huge. And then. I and did then, not have email in 1988. John. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. If you go back, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this. I hope your podcast, you know, <laughs> nobody tries, but if I was one of the beta testers for AOL. So if you, if, and Netscape, like if you send me an email, Jade uncle, what one word, Jade uncle, no, no numbers, no, it'll come right to me. Same thing, Jade Uncle at Netscape.net. Who still has a Netscape? I still have a Netscape account. <laughs> anyway, um, so fast forward, you know, and, and, and ten years, and and this thing grew like nothing to something. The Porsche, and, the Porsche list. Yeah, the Porsche yeah, list. Yeah, and that was yeah. the name of it, by yeah. the way. Okay, kept on breaking down. In 1998, then all of a sudden, you know, they're like, "This is ridiculous." Does anybody else know how to program? I go, "Yeah, I know how to program. Why? What you got?" And they go, well, we want to move this list server. And I go, well, yeah. I mean, at that point in time, I had a 56K frame relay, which was a full-time internet circuit, which nobody had in 1988. You know, they'd all have to call into AOL and you hear the, like, machine mm -hmm. talking to me and you'd be right. like, deaf, right? Anyway, so I'm like, yeah, I know how to do that, right? So anyway, I programmed this list server by the name of Porsche List. And uh, the domain name still exists. And by the way, Porsche got very upset and, you know, tried to sue me and then, oh, we don't want to sue you. And so they took the, and so I started Renlist and it became this huge 88,000 people on this email list. And then I started web forums and there. The, the web forums on Renlist are huge nowadays. I think they're, I don't know, half a million folks on it. Um, and it posts, I don't know, thousands of emails a day. So um, kind of, I, again, lucky I, I uh, had this, dot com company right and in the office that you're this is where all the servers are right and there's still servers in the next room and it's run out of my house over my garage funny enough and 
if I showed you the, the view out the window, you'd see like 27 lines coming into the side of the house. Um, kind of the neighborhood, neighborhood tree, uh, you know, place that all the birds congregate. Um, but yeah, I got, I, I, I sold that, which leads me into Haiti because in the midst of, oh, do I sell this thing? Right. It was Jen and I, we did everything. We had, you know, I think we had 35,000 or something paying members. They'd pay, you know, 20, 20 bucks on, on average, you know, every year. And then I had 200 sponsors and we'd bill everybody from here. My wife would come back from her job and we'd be laminating, you know, membership cards. And it got to be huge, right? I'm like, ah, oh, there's more to life. So I went down with my wife to, to Florida. My, my, my mother, God, God love my mother. And uh, she goes, oh, I met this guy. He worked in a warehouse. He's from Haiti. And he's really nice. I go, yeah? He goes, uh, yeah, his name's Andre. I go, well, mom, I'm thinking, oh, my God, she's going to be swindled, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about a woman that, you know, you put a dollar in, it goes out 15 ways out of the pocketbook. So in any event, so I'm like, oh, I'd like to meet this, mostly to see if he's going to swindle her. And what I found out, he really was a pastor in Haiti, super nice guy. God, Andre Forges. And Andre goes, yeah, I, I've got I, I'm, I've got an orphanage in Haiti. I go, what do you mean you have an orphanage? He goes, yeah, I got like 40 kids. I go, my, what? I go, you work in a warehouse. How do you support 40 kids? He goes, well, you know, I just, I, he goes, what, do you want to go to Haiti, Mr. John? I go, hmm? I had to go back and look up where Haiti was, right, on an atlas going, oh, it's not that far. I'd never been to Haiti, never even thought I'd go into Haiti. I couldn't spell Haiti, but kind of intrigued me. So, this is like early 2000s? Is it like yeah, early? Yeah, uh, probably 2002, 2003 kind of thing. A couple of years before the earthquake. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 okay. yeah. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm finishing up this week vacation. I'm shooting wildlife and, you know, uh, uh, Janding, Darling down there and Bailey track and stuff. And I turn to my wife and I go, I'm going to Haiti. She goes, what? I'm, go I'm, I'm going to Haiti. She goes, what? <laughs> now my wife, I love my wife because she puts up with me. And she's like, well, what happens when you get there? I go, honestly, I have no idea. I said, either I'll be dead because you, at that point in time, it wasn't the, it wasn't a tourist center. How's that? Or, you know, there's really going to be something to do. So I get off the plane, right? And, and I'm like, oh my God. Um, but this guy walks up, his name is uh, uh, Adrian Lewis. And, and Adrian and I are very, very good friends, still very good friends. And he goes, hi, Mr. John, how are you? And so we drive, we drive like four hours in this crickety old uh, pickup truck. And, and then we climb up this mountain. Seriously, there, we climb up this mountain. This, this path is not even good for a billy goat, but we climb up to the top of this mountain. And all of a sudden there's this little tin roof shack. And I'm like, what's this? He goes, this is the orphanage. And with that, the doors open. And th seriously, there were 25, 30 kids that came running out. And I'm like, oh my God. So I'm walking down the hill, meet all the kids. Amazing. I'm um, walking down the hill. I finally get cell phone service. I call my wife and I go, honey, I'm, I'm here in Haiti. I made it. And she goes, well, how's it going? I go, we're going to build an orphanage. She goes, we're going to do what? I go, we're going to build an orphanage. And so I had no idea what I was doing. No, nothing. Still don't. Anyway, so get back, fly back to the U.S. Um, and... I started 501c3 and using RenList and made the announcement that we were going to build an orphanage. So the RenList is the Porsche list, just to yeah, that's correct. Yeah. That's that huge community that that I I sold, mm -hmm. and um, ultimately it took a, it took you know a year and a half to get the deal done. So at that point in time, I knew I pretty well sure I was going to sell it. But um, you use the rentless community as your as your vehicle to help. Yeah, and then it got larger, much much larger, very quickly than than just rentless. I mean, during the earthquake, I actually got taken to Haiti because I speak Haitian Creole. It's the only way you can communicate with the kids. Everybody goes, "Oh, if you go to Haiti, you can speak French." No, you can't. Nobody understands you. Uh, you have to speak Haitian Creole, which is kind of English, African, little French. I have no idea what else is in there, but. Um, because I can, so I ended up doing a uh, uh, search and rescue uh, after the earthquake. Um, and then I did search and recovery, which is different than search and rescue. Um, and then I went down to, uh, I, based in, in Lakaias, in Port au Prince before then, doing the, during the search and rescue. And then uh, went down to uh, Kai, which is in the southern 
area of, of Haiti to do the food distribution there. Um, I, I, I have so many stories about what that was like and none of them you want to hear because I can go on for hours. But um, yeah, so we built that, we built an orphanage. I mean, and then we ended up building a school and then we ended up building another school and then we have college tuition programs and I had street kids and street boys and um, for medical uh, assistance and in emergencies. And so, yeah, we just kind of did it. I had no idea I'd ever build an orphanage or schools, but the schools, the, the orphanage now is self-sufficient. Um, it's a wonderful church that, that's become involved. Um, so that's self-sufficient. My school, both of them are self-sufficient. In one school, I've got 320 uh, uh, kids. Uh, they've got an opportunity to go to college if they want, um, because college down there is pretty inexpensive. Um, and funny enough, they, the local college is called American University. It's not the same one in, in mm -hmm. Washington, obviously, but um, they've got an opportunity. And in fact, I actually employed for a couple of years one of my college, a young lady that went through, super wonderful, Eileen, went through uh, the school program. Uh, she wanted to learn to become a bookkeeper down there and so she actually ran the bookkeeping facet of of this uh and adrian my my dear friend uh, adrian overlooked everything was kind of my project coordinator so as the construction was going on you know when you buy cement you actually got cement kind of thing and uh adrian did all that do you have anything built before the earthquake down there or was it all built after no, everything was built before the earthquake, as a matter of fact. Uh, maybe, and some of it was expanded post. Like the, uh, the school, uh, one of the schools was, was a three. And after the earthquake, you have to understand really quick digression here. Um, what really imploded were the multi-level multi, multi -level houses and homes in Haiti. And so when I went down post-earthquake and could catch my breath from, you know, doing all the stuff, um, they wanted Pastor Vilna wanted to add a fourth floor, and Adrian and I are like, no, 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 no. Given the earthquake, we need to expand, but we're not going up. We'll, we'll go out, kind of thing. Um, so the the construction was always ongoing and expanding, so to speak. But now it's finished. There's nowhere to move anywhere else. Um, but yeah, the the construction, most of it was started now, and and. It's not in Haiti, you don't decide to just make something and bum it appears. It, it's a progression. Um, you know, it's, it's like you start with this and then you expand and you expand and you expand. Um, and that's kind of what it's, that's kind of what it's like. Um, being an outsider, um, as I am, um, there, were, there were times down there though, I was very well accepted into the local communities. Whereas if you were, you know, a guy traveling down there and they didn't know who you were, you were in, you were in danger, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, it's not, like I said, it's not a tourist spot. Um, but yeah, it's it, the, the people down there, the kids, the kids, somebody asked me, you know, I guess about a year ago, oh, how, how many kids do you have, John? I go, I got about 1,700. And they just looked at me. And of course, I didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. I got 1,700, very active, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah. <laughs> That's it. I mean, honestly. I, so, I so I, yeah. obviously, the big, the big question about the, that everyone talks about about Haiti is the is the trafficking and like is you know it's is it's that true. it's all it, true. It's all yeah. True. I mean, they, they've got and it's socially acceptable. I mean, they're called restaviks, and uh, if you want the local term, you can Google that out. Um, but essentially, what these what happens is popular uh, birth control is an issue down there. Okay, how's that? And um, so it's not uncommon that you will find a, a mother specifically because there are a lot of single parent mothers down there. Um, you will find a mother will sell off daughters or sons because they can't afford to educate them. And, and going to school down there in the normal school system is expensive, right? They have uniforms, books, tuition, et cetera, et cetera. My school is a little bit different because Anyway, so you, you find parents that, or, or a mother or a single parent will, will, will sell off their, their child. 
right? And they will make it into the major cities and they will be brokered out from there, whether it be even to the US or, or you know, Western Europe or Asia uh, kind of thing. It is a real problem. It is a, it is a real problem. Um, and I've met, I've met mothers down there, very honest with you. And she'll put the hand on the, on the you know, daughter's head and said, yes, yeah, so this one I'm selling and this one I'm selling. And they think they're moving them on to better opportunities, i.e. education or, you know, things to eat or clothing or whatever. But the sad part is, is that the vast majority of those kids are uh, exploited. Uh, uh, I mean, you can go down into Kai nowadays and you'll meet, uh, my street boys were young kids, um, and, but they all had handlers, right? And the handler would be, you know, an older, typically male, um, that would broker these kids out locally. So, mm. yeah, it's a problem. So, how did that affect you? Mm. What is um... Because you said these are your kids. Yeah, yeah, um, and I, I look at it this way. I mean, for what I did, it's a it's a one little teeny ripple in this huge ocean. But I'm glad I made that ripple, um, and it, it gives you. You can talk about it. You can read about it. You can listen to it. But unless you see it firsthand it's it's eye-opening i mean i'll give you have we got time i don't even sure. know what yeah um, go during when i was doing food distribution we had a lot of private planes coming in and uh the privateer pilots were absolutely wonderful and uh for those that were stocking uh my my uh, uh you know the orphanage and, and schools and stuff because after the I used to i used those as a central area is a safe house kind of thing that you can come here, get your food, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, back to the story. So super nice private here comes in. He was based out of Colorado. Um, and he brought down uh, somebody a very well-to-do Colorado businessman and his teenage kids, a boy and a girl who were probably 14, 15. And these two kids felt, entitled though they were entitled uh, that's because that's the way they were brought up and I remember they get in the back and go and and the pilot said can you watch them for you know two or three days and i go yeah i can put them to work i'll have them sort medical supplies or you know do food distribution whatever and uh this young kid like a mission uh, trip almost for these kids right it, it, it was a vacation. It was a vacation yeah. for him, right? Yeah. Oh, let's go. Let's go see. I mean, I can't even explain. We had we had broadcast network news broadcasters seriously in the back of trucks, standing up, driving through town, being filmed by the film crews, right? So that they could show they were there. We had more churches, mostly out of Florida, for some reason. I don't know why. They would land at the local airport. They would photographer would get out their their chief pastor would get out take a you know 50 pound thing of rice out of the out of the out of the plane they'd take the picture they'd get back on the plane and leave leave the leave the rice there but you'd hear that this mission was down in haiti doing major work for food distribution i mean it was a circus it was a circus anyway so we get this kid and i go i'm going to show him what's up so we had this little white toyota pickup truck and all the my street kids knew it so when i'd drive into town and whatnot you'd hear mr john mr john mr john and so all of a sudden kids would pile in the back of the truck because they knew i'd take them down we'd feed them and clean them up and you know all the rest. i'm like i'm driving through the center of town i drive through the center of town all of a sudden like there were 30 little kids in the back with these entitled kids and they go mm -hmm. they're like where are we going i go we're gonna go eat they go what do we we're go we're all going to go eat. So we got down to Gillet, which is local uh, uh, beach with restaurants and whatnot. And um, I, I put these two entitled, the, the boy was the worst, put these two entitled kids with these street kids, right? And, you know, the, the evening's going on and, and the, this little entitled kid is getting wider eyed and wider eyed. 
And so finally I go, you know, why don't you tell them a story? So I translate their, their story, you know, and the stories where you, you can imagine. And all of a sudden this, this, you know, 16 year old kid gets up and he leaves. I'm like, oh my God, what happened? So I let him go. For about 15 minutes later, I'm getting worried because he doesn't come back. And again, it's not really safe for him to be out there in the evening or night. I go down on the beach and there he is. He is curled up, like sitting down with his knees and he's sobbing. And so I, I sit down, I go, you all right? He goes, no. I go, what's the matter? He goes, I had no idea. I heard from that kid's dad a year later and said that experience changed his life. And so that's, that's why I go back and I say, I can explain it. I can talk about it. I can tell you all the stories about rest of it and, you know, everything that goes on there. But unless you see it firsthand, you don't, I can't, I can't show you, you know. So, How often do you go still? I've cut way back ever since. And simply, be, I'll tell you why I've cut back. Because every time I go down, I get involved in another project and go, oh, why would I do that? So I've actually cut back quite a bit. And I think, you know, when I wanted to build all these things, I knew there was an end point that said, I need to do this and it needs to be transitioned. In other words, I don't want to raise students and orphans and kids and all the rest to be dependent. That's not what I, I don't want people to get the idea that it's a, it's a society of beggars, right? So my plans always had an end game and my end game is coming up. So I've cut way back. I do stay in touch obviously with everything and everybody going on down there. And, and it's one of those things that, yeah, we said we'd do it. We did it. And uh, I, I feel blessed that we were able to help, a couple of a couple of people and that's that's the way i look at it would you consider your what you've done in haiti as your greatest success no 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 i don't i honestly don't i don't think i have a greatest success um that's just me um i i did if 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 i if you had the same opportunity or anybody anybody listening had the same opportunities i had whether you say I created them or they were given to me, whatever it has to be, um, I would like to believe that you or whoever would have done the same thing. I mean, I was fortunate or lucky or whatever it happens to be. I, and I didn't need all that. And I figured if I could do something, then it was my time to do it. It's interesting. My, my mother's the one that, oh, what you've done down there is great work. And I look at it going, I don't really consider I've done anything that anybody else wouldn't do, right? I mean, that, that's just me. I have no problem turning to my wife back in the day going, I'm going to Haiti, right? And I would like to believe everybody's got that, that compassion. I, and I believe they would if they had the same opportunity. So getting back to it, no, I don't think it's great. I think it's you just do what you do, right, with what you're given, and that's what you do. And for some people, it's different. Like some people will feel comfortable about, oh, I put, you know, ten dollars in the in the church thing, and you know, now they can buy new hymnals. And to them, that's what they do, and that's their level of participation, and that's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Given who I am, what I did is putting ten dollars in the in the church mm -hmm. thing, uh, and it's interesting because when you stop and think about it, my greatest supporters occurred outside my, my extended family had, they were aghast that I would do something like that. I mean, totally aghast, right? How can you, how can you help these people? Right. They're all beggars, except for my wife and, and, and my two children and my mom, of course. Um, so the support for it or the encouragement and support, I guess, um, really came from the wider community, not, not my own extended family, which is an interesting paradigm, right? Interesting. Yeah, it is. it is. It's interesting how the people closest to you want to protect you in some way and not, yeah. and not see you, you know, not see you go out and use your gifts to your fullest ability in some way. 
Right. Which is an right. interesting. Yeah. Any regrets? Hmm. That I, I don't know. I lost kids. Um, I don't think I would change anything. Maybe, maybe do more um, in that regard. Insofar as Haiti is concerned, I mean, to me, it's a finished book. I, I, I said what I was going to do. We went and did it. Everybody went and did it as a community here. And they, they, they believed that I could, and they believed in me and um, trusted me. That was huge. Uh, trusted me to go do it. And we did it. And so that chapter's closed. I don't, I don't know if I could have done more. Uh, just because there's only so much you can do. I mean, I was doing that from, when did I start? A 2002, 2003 thing. Um, so I did it for over a decade, really, well over a decade. But I don't know. I'd love to say, oh, could have done more. But I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if I could have. Yeah, it's pretty cool that it's you've turned it into a self, self-sustaining thing. That's a, that's, yeah, that's, that's a testament, yeah. Yeah, it had to be. I mean, you, you can't build something, then patronize it and, and say, oh, look at what we did. So give more and then go, well, that's closed now. That reminds me of the of the ministers getting off the planes with the 50-pound bag of rice going, here we are, and then leaving. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's just not the way I work. Does that uh, happen a lot still today, you think? Is that, I mean, do people, oh, sure. do oh, people sure. still? And, uh, yeah, Haiti's different. Uh, um, the first thing that people want to do is support Haiti. They do. So they give to their churches. I was one of the few NGOs out there that wasn't a missionary or a mission, right? And what happens is when they give, when, when, when the congregation in a local church gives, which is so bizarre, the first thing they want to do is build a church. That's why Haiti's got more churches than... Carter has a little green liver pill. You can't walk a block without tripping over a church, right? Mm-hmm. Now, and when I went down there first, I'm like, what's up with Adrian? What's up with all these churches? He goes, oh, these are all the people that want to help out Haiti. And I go, the kids can't sleep in a church. They can't eat in a church. Why the hell is there a church? Excuse my French guy. Right. But, you know, why the hell is there a church? Well, because that's the way the, the congregation thinks they can support Haiti. And I'm like, that's broken. So, yeah, I was one of the, I'm not a, preach a pastor a rabbi a minister right and i'm like this is fundamentally broken i mean it's broken but that's again it gets back to that's what people's comfort level is supporting the church right and, and god love them for doing it that's what makes them feel good then god bless them you know? yeah. so what are you doing now what are you doing now to keep yourself busy uh, i'm really kind of having fun i mean i, I for photography to f- swap gears i mean now's because you're pretty much a you're pretty much a photographer these days right yeah almost 100 percent. right exactly right i mean you know there are a couple of legs to the stool you know that makes up photography for me um if fortunately for me the you know the two of the legs are kind of gone real estate forget you know you can't go shoot a house nowadays um <laughs> even if you did nobody's going to market it and then too nobody's going to buy it so you know what the heck so that's gone. Um, my gallery, God, I love my gallery. They sell my prints. Uh, they're local to Portsmouth. And so that's kind of the second leg of the stool. But now they're closed. They're really doing as great a job as they can to maintain, you know, some kind of traffic, i.e., you know, if you see a print, we'll work with the artist. And they're really promoting that. And they're doing a great job with that. So I'm fortunate in that relationship. Um, and then the third one is, is my online, which is, you know, my Death Valley prints mm-hmm. and, and, you know, kind of non-area prints. That's, like all photographers, that's, that's hard because of discretionary income, which used to allow people to buy that, very conservatively spent nowadays, as, as can be expected. Look at the market. Look at, I mean, you know, disposable discretionary income isn't all that it used to be kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of dried up, which if you're creative, which you are as well, and I presume a lot of these folks that are going to be listening to this uh, are, now's the time to explore. Now's the time to really push. Now's, now's if, if you go and you shoot images typically at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, right? Don't do that anymore. Get up, go to your garden before the sun rises. Look at what blue hour looks like and takes an image, right? Or... 
if you've wanted to learn something in, in you know, Photoshop, go learn. You know, you've got, you've got plenty of time, right? Mm -hmm. go, go take your old images and figure out, here, here's something that, that's really kind of cool, is take an image you were really, really proud of two years ago, right? Three years ago, pick a time, I don't care when. And now with everything you've learned, go reprocess it. And if you don't look at that previous image and now look at your new work and go, wow, then you really haven't progressed. So try pushing yourself and be creative. I mean, find that, find that glue that kind of holds you together. Now's mm -hmm. the perfect time to do it. Um, I would hate to be a photographer that's a YouTube photographer, right? Having to produce new content. And now what do you do? Even if, and half of those photographers can't even take a picture, but that's a different issue. But, right. you know, I mean, go push, go learn, go. If you're into mentoring, now is the time to pick up the students because the students are sitting there going, what do I do? And they're getting thirsty to learn. Right. So, so thinking yeah. back, going, going back like 30 years, like would you have ever imagined that you'd be at your place now where your job is your hobby? Uh, this is going to sound strange and kind of cliche -ous, but I don't think in my entire career I've had a job. Okay. I, I, I've always loved what I've done, and I kind of do whatever. And my wife will tell you I'm kind of a type AAA. When I get into something, that's, that's the world, right? Whether it was working with a, with a client when I had the consulting business or doing the, the Porsche site or whatever. I mean – and I, so I never regretted getting up in the morning, right? And I've had some crappy jobs I, right up front with you. I mean, I used to unload and in, in put myself through college. I used to unload boxcars at a General Foods warehouse for food distribution, okay? I mean, talk about, you know, have, try unloading a boxcar full of glass, a glass uh, tang, right? The tang used to be, you know, packaged in glass bottles. And those suckers were like 80 pounds a box and they would be, I don't even know, 5,000 boxes in a, in a, in a box car. I mean, I've had some crappy jobs, but even that was an adventure, right? You get out at the end of the day, you'd be dying and get up the next morning, go do it again and be like, Oh, thank God. I don't have a box car full of tank. So to answer your question, I never, I, I was really fortunate. I never, I don't think I ever had a job. I just was able to make money doing what I love, if that makes sense. So that's just, it's just me. That's just me. I, I like that because it's, it's about, you know, finding ways to provide for yourself and your family and things that you enjoy doing. I mean, instead of just going out and getting a job, I mean, looking for opportunities in all sorts of different ways. And I think, yeah. especially today, I think everyone's a little bit worried about where the next dollar is going to come from. And I think, um, you know, the opportunities are there for sure. Uh, no question about it. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think we, we I'll, I'll just say this. We get really comfortable in what it is we know kind of thing. But the real excitement of life is exploring what it is we don't know. And that, that transcends, transcends not only what you choose as a career, but as well, you know, insofar as photography, the excitement you, you and I can sit, out, sit there and look at every image and pump out the same thing. It all looks like Doug Sanquist or John or whatever. That's not exciting, right? What's exciting is going, if I push this or I learn this or if I try that, what's going to happen? That's the excitement. That's where it happens, right? But we get so lulled into being sure we don't veer off that course. If you look at my Instagram feed, it's a mess, right? Mm -hmm. For as new as it is. Right. It's a mess. I have Death Valley images. I have film images. I have like four different user groups that follow me and they don't know what I'm going to post up next. And you know something? I don't care. Right? Right. It's not my revenue model. So right. Instagram for me and a lot of the social media, it, it, it's a place for me to show what I'm capable of doing. And it really, I, for some people, they live and die by the likes. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Right. Put up what you are proud of. Uh, you want somebody to look at. You're in a huge, like, spinning thing of a, of a news feed. And if somebody pauses for a brief moment, you won. You were successful, whether they like it or not. 
So use those things. And, and there are people that live and die by, oh my God, I only have three likes or, oh my God, I got, look at me. I've got 2000 likes. So right. what? Who cares? Right? right. You know, anybody with a camera and a computer can start a YouTube channel. Who cares? Right. right. right? doesn't make them creative. It doesn't make them, it means they've got a computer and a camera. Right. So be proud of what you're doing. Push and, and stop gauging your success on the day. The days of being able to put up a hot photo and all of a sudden getting, you know, a gazillion followers, those days are gone. You're a victim of algorithms and news feeds now. That's what you are. And I'm not going to compete against algorithms and all the rest. I don't care. I, re I do my art because it's for me. And if somebody else takes pleasure in it and enjoys it, that's the icing on the cake. That's the, but I'm not going to pander to them. My mother did that as a professional watercolor artist. Her early work was phenomenal. And then she tried to play to the crowd, her, her, her potential customers. And, and frankly, she, you know, imploded because of that, because she lost she lost her creativity trying to pander to what she thought people wanted. It doesn't matter. If you think you know what people want out of your images, you'll be wrong. I can tell you. I'll take an image down in my gallery. I think it is phenomenal. I know it's just going to go flying off the shelves. And it sits there for months, years. Usually I end up bringing them back. So it's just stop playing the game. Start focusing on being creative. And that's kind of me right i think that pretty much uh that's that's a pretty good biography of uh john dunkel right there yeah that's, i mean when you think about when you think about that when you think of every single story you've told me over the last hour so i haven't even i don't even have the timer up right now but yeah. you know i mean just doing what you think is the right thing to do and just imagine I mean, ultimately, you ulti sitting on a thumbtack when you're like two years old. <laughs> it's the way, the way great things start, right? I don't know. <laughs> that's it. That's yeah. it. I mean, you know, and I think I think that's it's a it's an interesting story because um, so many of us don't know what we're supposed to do, and we don't have that internal um, motor that says, "Get on the plane and go to Haiti." We don't have the little motor that says, go do this. Or say it another way, we may have that little spark that says, go do that, but what if I fail? Or it says, go, but what if my family will say, you can't go? Or what if somebody says that that was the wrong thing to do? Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, Ultimately, we all have to just listen to that little internal voice, that little spark that says go. And I think if we're willing to go, um, amazing things can happen. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, and it's all about taking a risk and believing in yourself. And, and trust me, if you had a five hour show, I could tell you about all my failures because my God, I've had more failures than so I've been talking on, you know, an hour about the successes and, and, but I wouldn't have had the successes without the failures. I mean, and that's the reality. You learn more. If you think you have to, you have to think a little bit, you're going to learn more about failure and how to structure for success because not everybody's ready or they can't handle success. We, we know that. We see that every day in those that are, quote, our heroes. They have a tough time handling success, right? Um, the really successful people are the ones that you don't know are successful because they don't have to show you. They don't have to tell you. They don't have to brag about it. And to me, those are my heroes. Those are my heroes. They're the ones that will take the time and go out of their way for no reason whatsoever and help you improve yourself or help you to become better than you are or be successful. Those are the heroes. It's not the ones that society idolizes. I mean, to think that movie stars have an opinion more, more informed than you and me or should count more is abominable. I mean, come on, they're movie stars, right? But we idolize them. And I'm like, it's just not right. But people don't get it. They're, they're into the National Enquirer of the world. And 
which is a sad statement in itself. But I think you're right. I, th- I, I truly believe, Doug, that everybody's got that little clock that you're talking about, or that little voice going, I really want to. And, and But I don't think... I don't think I'm any different than anybody else. And I think I'd like to believe that anybody with the same kind of kind of introspect would do the same thing given they were able to. How's that? I, I, I just believe in human nature and I've seen horrific things and have incredible joy. So I've seen both ends of the spectrum. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't think I do anything different. All right. So, what would your current self say to your young self? Mm. Just like Nike, yeah, just do it. Just do it. Have have the confidence in yourself, and don't be don't be egotistical about it. Be gracious about it, um, and be honorable. If you say you're going to do something, then that's wh- whether anybody's watching or not. Whether you're, I mean, let's be honest. I, I could have I could have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars and gone. I I'm going to build an orphanage. Never built anything, which is kind of the way everything works nowadays, unfortunately. But 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 I never paid myself a salary out of it because I didn't want to. I wanted to go into the kids and I I have the honor and integrity. If you're going to do something, then you've set up a standard by which you're going to be measured. And so again, I would tell my younger self, just do it. Just do it. with integrity, with honor, just do it. I like that. Thanks, John. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. My pleasure. You're an inspiration to me and hopefully uh, an inspiration to, uh, others that listen and um until next time thank you you got it thank you doug